mobile strap. Mother 3i was released just a few months later on February 6, 2007, and was composed by Shogo Sakai. It contained different tracks to those found on Mother 3 Plus. But across both albums, not all of the staggering 250 tracks featured in the game have been commercially released. While Mother 3 never saw release in the West, both Lucas and Klaus appear in Super Smash Bros. from Brawl onwards. Lucas was initially intended to replace Ness in Melee, but Sakurai decided against this after the continuous delays. Their appearance in the Smash series makes them the only playable characters to be from a game not released outside of Japan. Despite the online presence and popularity of Mother 3, Nintendo has continually teased the idea of the game receiving localization, but never committed. The reasons behind this decision have never been made fully clear, and so fans have made a number of assumptions as to why this might be. Above all else, people look to sales of the earlier released Earthbound on SNES. The game was notorious for its advertising, which many blame for its lackluster sales, as well as the fact that it was released while Focus was moving away from the SNES. Despite this, the game has a strong Western following, and has shown reasonable sales through digital re-releases. Mother 3 was also created for the Game Boy Advance at a time when Nintendo had begun to focus on their newest handheld, the Nintendo DS. During 2006, several games were published by Nintendo for the GBA in Japan, but only two other titles were released in the US, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon and Game Freak's Drill Dozer. As well as this, some themes and scenes in the game would likely require altering for any sort of official release, but this might be an issue considering they are integral to the game's plot. A number of controversial subjects play central roles in the game, including the acceptance of death, animal abuse, and scenes of violence. Some important sections of the game also make reference to drug use, as well as a portion of the game that displays male-on-male -male kissing. A fan translation was created by a number of fans of the Mother series, led by Clyde Tomato Mandolin. The effort was sizable, with a large group coming together to not just hack the game to make the translation work, but translate the roughly 1,000 pages worth of script. The translation came about after fans tried their best to show an interest in the game internationally, but to no response from Nintendo. A few months after release, Nintendo announced that the company had no interest in translating the game. It would be only a few days after this statement that the fan translation was announced on the Earthbound community site Starmen.net. It took the group two years to have the translation completed, with the patch downloaded 100,000 times in its first week. Co-founder of Starmen and general PR representative of the project, Reed Young, has stated that higher-ups at Nintendo of America were aware of the work being made. In an interview with Ars Technica, he stated, Nintendo definitely knew about the project. We're not real comfortable discussing the details, but word of the project reached the highest levels of the company, at least at NOA. For whatever reason, they never interfered. Even now, we don't know if that makes us happy or sad, because we made it very clear that we would end the project immediately if they made any kind of announcement about their plans for the game's future. The translation is of significantly high quality, being released alongside a 200-page full-color player's guide created by the team of translators, comparable to the likes of commercially released guidebooks. Only a few alterations were made to the game, such as changing the name of Yokuba to Facade, altering some graphics to be more fitting with the Western release of Earthbound, and changing the dialect of some mice from Japanese to Cockney English. The group even made a public offer to Nintendo to use their translation, granting the company permission for full use without charge, though it seems to have been to no avail. The game saw a re-release on the Wii U Virtual Console in Japan in 2015, which sparked many in the community to push for Nintendo to also publish the game in the West. Despite some staff at Nintendo having made it clear that they are aware of the interest surrounding the title internationally, there has yet to be any official statement on the game's lack of release or that it may be released in the future. Whether it will ever happen continues to remain a hotly debated topic, with the community divided, some claiming that its localization will inevitably happen, and others saying that it never will. Come on, Reggie, give us Mother 3! How about this instead? <laughs> in today's episode, we will be looking at a collection of Nintendo Easter eggs. The 90s hip-hop rivalry between the East and West coasts of North America is one which continues to resonate with artists to this day. 
Tupac Shakur and Notorious B.I.G. were at the heart of this feud. While the pair may have passed on, their influence in music and pop culture is still evident, and it also seems this influence extends to gaming. After the release of Splatoon 2's DLC, the Octo Expansion, fans noticed a nod to both rappers. The outfits worn by both Pearl and Marina are based on the distinct looks often represented by Biggie and Tupac respectively, fitting for a world that has an aesthetic heavily influenced by the hip-hop genre, not just musically, but also visually. In an interview with Game Informer, Hisashi Nogami was asked directly about this reference. He said, We're definitely aware of that history of music videos in America, and music video culture is something we kept in mind while making this expansion. We have members on our development team who are fans of hip-hop music and hip-hop culture, and it's people like that who feel that, just like our real world we're living in, we can bring a variety of elements into the world of Splatoon and show people that it's not just a one-note type of world. While on the topic of Splatoon, the first game in the series includes a small nod within its sound effects. In the Museum di Alfonsino, two statues can be found. One detail about these statues is that they actually emit a small laugh throughout a nighttime match, which is very difficult to come by. A member of the Game FAQ's forum, Michael Ike9, noticed that these laughs match up closely with the death cry of a boss featured in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, Kaloktos. After being defeated, Kaloktos lets out the sound of several small children laughing. There's no confirmation as to whether this was an intention laughing. There's no confirmation as to whether this was an intentional nod to Skyward Sword, or whether it's just a member of the team reusing a sound clip from Nintendo's extensive audio asset library. From fishy to funky, next we're looking at a fresh little reference hidden away in Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. When the player controls Funky Kong upon leaving his fly and buy store, there's a chance that talks will spur the player on by exclaiming, Give him the old banana slammer, dude! This line is in reference to Donkey Kong's catchphrase from the short-lived, horrendously animated Donkey Kong Country animated TV series. Banana While you might think an extensive knowledge of poorly received 90s animated TV shows is specialist, this next reference requires somebody with some real-world skills to notice. A few hidden messages can be heard in Wii Sports Resort. In the game's island flyover mode, several noises can be heard coming from the island's lighthouse, also known as the candle. These sounds are actually Morse code. A total of three messages can be interpreted, translating to, Morse code takes forever! It sure does. Does anyone out there know Morse code? Sorry, use your radio. Why does anyone use Morse code anymore? Good question. Even cheat codes can have messages attached to them. For Pokemon Puzzle League, a few passwords are actually related to the series. To temporarily unlock Mewtwo's stage for the game's two-player mode, the player has to hold Z while entering B up L B A start A up then R. Taking the first letter of each input of the password spells out the word Bulbasaur. Setting Marathon to its fastest speed is simply B A L L, spelling out ball. And to unlock the cheat mode, the player simply enters ABRA twice, which, of course, refers to the Pokémon Abra. And now for this episode's random piece of trivia. We'll be looking at the 3DS's Street Pass Me Plaza. Changes to games because of local law is relatively common, but sometimes that law can invoke the smallest of changes. In the Japanese and American Street Pass Me Plaza, attempting to purchase DLC from a rabbit and then declining to buy it will cause the rabbit to depressively say, Oh, I see. However, the European version removed the rabbit's morose response and replaced it with a more neutral, Fair enough, instead. This change was to abide with European laws put in place to prevent manipulating children into purchases, as the upset response to the player not spending money could be considered emotionally manipulative. The law states, Games should not include practices that are aggressive or which otherwise have the potential to exploit a child's inherent inexperience, vulnerability, or credulity, or to place undue influence or pressure on a child to make a purchase.
Did you know? Kirby's design was originally a placeholder for another character and wasn't intended to be used at all. Kirby's creator, Masahiro Sakurai, became fond of Kirby's simple design and decided to make him the star of the game. At the time, the game was titled Twinkle Popo, and Kirby's name was Popopo. This was actually referenced in Kirby Mass Attack, which is set in the Popopo Islands. In a Game Informer interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, Miyamoto stated that the Kirby name was partly chosen because of John Kirby, who defended Nintendo in a lawsuit against Universal over similarities between the movie King Kong and the arcade game Donkey Kong. The name Kirby was on a list of potential names for the characters, and the developers thought it would be funny if John Kirby had a connection with their cute character. Another thing that influenced choosing the name Kirby was that Kirby's a soft, cute character. Cute Japanese characters often have soft-sounding names to match their appearance. Miyamoto thought that the juxtaposition of a cute character with a harsh-sounding name like Kirby was also funny. For a while, Kirby's color scheme was undecided. Sakurai wanted Kirby to be pink, but Miyamoto wanted him to be yellow. Ultimately, Nintendo decided Kirby should be pink. Miyamoto's yellow Kirby was used as the default color for Player 2 whenever there's multiple player-controlled Kirbys on screen. Before Kirby's final color scheme was chosen, Nintendo of America localized Kirby's Dreamland. They were confused as to whether Kirby was pink or yellow and didn't know how to represent him on the box art. They decided to play it safe and make Kirby white like he appears in the game. And speaking of box art, several Kirby games had their covers changed in the West. The Japanese versions all show Kirby smiling or neutral, but the North American box arts all show Kirby angry. It's thought these changes were made to compensate for cultural differences between Japan and North America. Kirby's Epic Yarn wasn't originally a Kirby game at all. It started off as a game called Fluff of Yarn and starred Prince Fluff. The game was reworked over several months to fit more in line with the Kirby universe. Kirby took the lead role and Prince Fluff was pushed to the side, becoming Kirby's partner. Kirby's Return to Dreamland also had an unusual development period. Development began shortly after Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards was completed, meaning Return to Dreamland had a development cycle of 11 years. The style of the game started off very similar to Crystal Shards with two movement on a 3D environment. It also supported four characters. This is the version of the game we saw at E3 2005 and was set to be released that same year. The game was scrapped due to problems with the four-player mechanics. The second attempt at making a new Kirby game was a sort of open-world 3D platforming game. The developers didn't feel the game achieved the level of quality they were hoping for and it never reached completion. The third attempt returned to the side-scrolling roots of Kirby but had the graphical style of a pop-up book. The developers ultimately realized that the previous attempts failed because of the focus on multiplayer, so they decided to refocus their efforts on creating a fun single-player game. This final attempt used some elements from the failed experiments and became Kirby's Return to Dreamland. In Kirby's Return to Dreamland, if you take the first letter from the title of every level in the game besides the final level, Another Dimension, they will spell out the word crowned. The game's final boss wears a crown, and a theme called crowned plays during the final boss battle in the game's extra mode. The French version of the game also has a hidden word, where the first letter of each of the levels spells parfait, which means perfect in French. Kirby's Dream Collection also has a hidden word. In the game's challenge mode, the levels are named Happiness Hall, Apricot Atrium, and Last Land. Taking the first letter from each level spells out HAL, a self-referential nod from the game's developers, HAL Laboratory. In Kirby Canvas Curse, the first letter from the title of each level, besides the game's final level, spells out RAINBOW. Something similar occurs in Kirby's Adventure, where the levels spell out Viv G YOR. When read backwards, it says ROY G BIV, which is an acronym for remembering the colors of the rainbow. Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards Fifth World holds a rather bleak secret. You might notice that it bears a striking resemblance to Earth, but is entirely frozen over. The world has factories full of robots, but with no biological operators in sight. Nintendo has said that the inhabitants of the planet all had to move, presumably because of the climate. This has led fans to speculate that Shiver Star is actually a post-apocalyptic Earth. It's not sure what Nintendo's intention was when making Shiver Star, but it could be some sort of statement on climate change, or possibly even a suggestion that Kirby takes place in our own universe. In the Spring Breeze fight with King DDD and Kirby Superstar, you can see Toad, Mario, Luigi, and Birdo making a cameo appearance in the stands. What makes this cameo even more interesting is that these aren't the only characters that were meant to be shown. Scrolling outside of the viewable area of the screen will show Princess Peach, Poppy Bros Jr., and Bowser. Princess Peach was partially viewable, and this is probably why she was moved to be fully viewable in the stands of Kirby Superstar Ultra for the DS. Some other secrets and easter eggs include Kirby Kirby dancing on the pause screen of Kirby's Dream Land if you wait for 20 seconds, and a crude drawing of a naked woman in the background of the level Red Canyon. There's also an unused Waddle Doo enemy in Kirby's Block Ball, where the Waddle Doo's death animation shows his eye bursting out of his head. 
Kirby's creator, Masahiro Sakurai, also provided the voice of King Dedede and Kirby 64 and Super Smash Bros. Brawl. <laughs> In today's episode, we'll be looking at changes in re-releases of Nintendo games. Games are often changed and updated over time, and these changes range anywhere from small bug fixes to a total overhaul of a game's mechanics. This can be done with downloadable patches and DLC, or in the case of the Pokemon franchise, with re-releases of games. The Safari Zone in Pokemon Red and Blue requires a $500 entrance fee to be paid up front, providing the player with access to the park, 30 Safari Balls, and a 500-step limit. If the player is exceptionally careless with their money and runs out of funds to be able to afford this entrance fee, they will unfortunately get stuck. This situation could arise if the player runs out of trainers to fight and has no items to sell. Without funds to enter the park, the player would be halted from progress in the game, as the park contains HM03, Surf, which allows players to travel to Cinnabar Island. With Pokemon Yellow, it seems the developers felt this was a big enough issue to be addressed. As a result, with this release of Yellow, if the player speaks with the Safari Zone worker without the money to enter, he will take pity and allow the player to enter with only a single Safari Ball. This change was made so that players wouldn't find themselves in a position where they'd have to restart the game from the very beginning if they found themselves in the unlikely scenario of having no funds. While this friendly fix was added in Pokemon Yellow, the original text of the attendant telling the player that they can't enter without paying the fee can still be found in the game's data. This wouldn't be the last time a Pokemon game would be updated to fix an oversight. The game Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Red Rescue Team and Blue Rescue Team were released together and would connect in an unusual way. One title would go into the Game Boy Advance slot, and the other would go into the Nintendo DS cartridge slot, allowing them to interact. This inventive use of the DS had some unforeseen consequences, however. Due to a programming error in the original Japanese release of Blue Rescue Team, the game would cause any and all save data to be erased from the Game Boy Advance game in the bottom slot if it wasn't Red Rescue Team. In other words, players could lose their save files by attempting to play other Game Boy Advance games between sessions of Blue Rescue Team, if they didn't take out their Game Boy Advance cartridge before booting up Blue Rescue Team. This was clearly a big issue for people making use of the DS's backwards compatibility, and the bug was fixed in all subsequent releases of Blue Rescue Team. Another example of changes made to a re-release of a game can be found in the 3DS Virtual Console version of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX released more than a decade after the original. Throughout the game, the player has the chance to encounter the Old Broom Lady. When initiating conversation, Link was always met with a hearty Yahoo from the woman. However, in the 2013 Virtual Console re-release, this dialogue was changed to a few different variations like Hello and Yippee! Legend of Localization author Clyde Mandolin, aka Tomato, speculated that this was changed following the growth of the search engine and internet giant Yahoo, particularly because the phrase in-game is not only the same word, but also appears in the same format as the company's logo, with the lettering in block capitals followed by an exclamation mark. Digital re-releases often face minor changes, with some being more noticeable than others. When publishing some games for Virtual Console, old licensing rights have to be considered and adjusted. Wave Race 64 was one of these games, which held a license with Kawasaki, an engineering company who specialized in motorsports. This included the use of the Kawasaki brand for banner advertisements seen around the barrier of the track. When releasing the game on the Wii Virtual Console, these banners were changed from Kawasaki to Nintendo DS advertisements. This was because the license to show Kawasaki's brand had expired between the game's first release and the digital re-release. However, unlike most altered re-releases, when the game was re-released for a second time on the Wii U Virtual Console, these banners were changed back to Kawasaki-branded advertising. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're looking at the classic Nintendo 64 arcade racing game, Cruisin' USA. If the player achieves a high score in the game, they'll be asked to enter their initials for the high scoreboard. After entering the initials, holding left for about a minute while controlling the conveyor belt will lead to a decapitated head sliding past and saying, I love this job! The 3DS was released in 2011 and boasted a somewhat divisive feature, 3D functionality. While most users would turn the console's 3D function off, the system would go on to lead the handheld gaming market race, with Sony's PlayStation Vita lagging behind. 
This was mostly due to each system's lineup of quality games, which the 3DS had plenty of. One of the most acclaimed and best-selling 3DS titles is Pokémon Sun and Moon. A new addition to these games were the Alolan forms of existing Pokémon, which were introduced by developers in order to illustrate that Pokémon are living, changing creatures. The team wanted to show that Pokémon who had migrated to the Alola region would follow a different evolutionary path to their original counterparts, similar to the way real animal species in the Galapagos Islands followed their own unique evolutionary paths. Certain Alolan forms caught more attention than others, with Executor arguably standing above the rest. What's interesting is that there is evidence that Executor actually hails from the Alolan Islands in the first place. Its Pokedex entry in Pokémon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, and their remakes, states the Executor originates from the tropics. Funnily enough, Alola is the first tropical setting in the series, and features its own version of the creature. Executor's Pokémon Crystal Pokédex also states that, in a good environment, it will grow more heads, as is seen on its Alolan form's extra branch. And Pokémon Sun's Pokédex states that Alola is the best environment for this Pokémon. The creature's design may also be a nod to artwork for the Japanese Jungle Trading Card Booster Box, which depicts Executor with an elongated body. Speaking of Pokémon, Nintendo once held a contest surrounding Pokémon Art Academy, an educational game designed to teach players how to draw a variety of Pokémon. The competition involved creating artwork, with the chance of it being featured on a Pokémon trading card. The prize turned out to be 100 copies of the card, specifically the only 100 copies of that card to ever be printed. Three separate contests were held for different regions – Japan, North America, as well as Europe and Oceania. The contests had two categories – Dress Up Pikachu and Your Favorite Pokémon. Each category had five winners in Japan and three elsewhere. In total, the contest resulted in the printing of only 2,200 cards, making the final products extremely limited, and thus likely to fetch a decent price to collectors. Another of the 3DS's most popular first-party games was Nintendogs and Cats, which followed on from Nintendogs on the DS. Nintendo had considered a follow-up from Nintendogs after its successful sales figures, and came up with a variety of ideas on how to build upon its foundations. The obvious choice was to change direction from the household pet of a dog and moving to animals ordinarily not found in the home, such as horses or dolphins. However, after many fans of the game requested a version that included cats, the team went as far as to create test builds of the game which would replace the models of dogs to those of cats entirely. These earlier builds simply replaced the character models and not their animations or behavior, meaning that cats would behave more like dogs, such as wagging their tails when happy. Shigeru Miyamoto was reluctant to create a follow-up with cats, as it didn't seem like a move Nintendo would typically make, whose ideas tend to come out of left field. However, it was revealed in 2009 that Miyamoto had actually got a cat of his own. Nintendo would often keep the private life of Miyamoto secret, as his hobbies would lead to inspiration for future releases, such as his interest in weighing himself leading to Wii Fit, his interest in gardening resulting in Pikmin, and of course, his caring for a family dog leading to the first Nintendogs. His newly found love for a household cat, and in particular how both his dog and cat would get along with one another, reminded him of the 1963 Disney film The Incredible Journey. The film saw Luath the Labrador, Bojit the Bull Terrier, and Teo the Siamese Cat journeying across the Canadian wilderness to make their way home, later remade as Homeward Bound. This led to his decision to make a new pet simulator involving cats. Miyamoto stated, Making a game called Nintendo Cats just didn't seem right for Nintendo. But people all over the world love cats, so I wanted to put cats in a game somehow. But when I actually got a cat, I realized there just aren't as many things to do with a cat as there are with a dog that we may use in our entertainment. I concluded that showing how dogs and cats interact would be just right. Another first-party Nintendo game which changed direction based on the real lives of developers was Super Mario 3D Land. During a talk at the Game Developers Conference in 2012, lead director of the title, Goishi Hayashida, revealed several ideas the team threw together during the planning stages of the game. These included concepts such as Mario changing sizes dramatically, and even replacing Princess Peach's face with a photograph of the player's girlfriend. None of these ideas had passed the
together during the planning stages of the game. These included concepts such as Mario changing sizes dramatically and even replacing Princess Peach's face with a photograph of the player's girlfriend. None of these ideas had passed the early conceptual stage, but one thing that Hayashida would continue to bring up was his inspiration from Miyamoto, particularly his desire for players to find happiness and his philosophy of enjoying everything, including the work of creating games. Hayashida went on to remind the audience of the traumatic events of March 11, 2011, when a powerful earthquake shook the northeastern coast of Honshu, the main island of Japan, causing widespread devastation and damage across the country, initiating a large tsunami which triggered a major nuclear accident in a power station located on the coast. This was the largest fault slip ever recorded, shifting planet Earth on its axes, resulting in 5 million tons of debris washing into the Pacific Ocean and a death toll exceeding 15,000. The Super Mario 3D Land team are based in Tokyo and felt the effects of the quake, the aftershocks, and the general state of panic across the country. Hayashida was unsure on whether he would ever be able to return to enjoying work with this tragedy hanging over him. But soon, the team became recommitted to the project with the belief that they could deliver something to a nation that needed happiness now more than ever. Hayashida considered his mission successful, quoting one player who stated, This game has been like a light finally shining into what has been such a depressing time. I feel like this game has given me the power to go on living. Yet another game that shifted direction, though for less emotional reasons, is Bravely Default. During the early stages of development for the 3DS, the game started its life as a sequel to Final Fantasy The Four Heroes of Light for the Nintendo DS. Square Enix decided to repurpose the game, however, in order to change it from part of the Final Fantasy series to a new IP entirely. This was to not confuse modern-day Final Fantasy fans, as the direction the game had taken was particularly different from the more recent iterations of the Final Fantasy series, being closer in style to older installments. During these earlier stages, the game played like a standard RPG, more akin to Final Fantasy 3 and 5, but when the game took on a new IP, concerns were raised. The decision was made to allow players to default on their turn, effectively storing up points that could be used to unleash more attacks in subsequent turns. Director and head of development for the team at Silicon Studio, Kensuke Nakahara, stated, We were discussing something in the battles that would be simple yet provide deeper strategy, such as the charge command in the Dragon Quest series. With this gameplay system, I felt like it really had the chance to turn the whole game around. Another RPG on the 3DS is Project Cross Zone, which saw the crossover of characters from several publishers in a singular game. In an interview with Weekly Famitsu, producer of Project Cross Zone, Kensuke Sukanaka, spoke about the name of their game. He explained that the team originally considered choosing something which incorporated all three of the names of the publishers involved, Bandai Namco, Capcom, and Sega. However, this name was considered to be too long, unsurprisingly. He also brought up the Japanese exclusive Namco Cross Capcom, released on the PlayStation 2, and that if this game had been a sequel, they possibly could have used the company names in the title. But because the game was a new IP, they wanted to differentiate the series. Another idea that never saw fruition comes from Project Cross Zone 2. The team had approached Hideki Kamiya, director of Devil May Cry and Bayonetta, asking to include Bayonetta within the title. Kamiya, however, refused. In a tweet, he explains that he said no because he wanted to create the game which would see both Bayonetta and Dante cross over himself on his own terms. After considering the fans of both series, he now somewhat regrets the decision. However, if Project Cross Zone 3 does ever come out, he would like her to join the roster. Making a game appeal to an audience is important, and many developers believe that the audience likely knows what best appeals to them. Before the release of Epic Mickey Power of Illusion, Disney asked their fans to vote on which version of the game's box art should be used, one that showed the game's villains and one which did not. Ultimately, the audience chose the design showing the villains, though this brought with it a remnant of earlier ideas. Wonderland, the world of Alice in Wonderland, was originally going to make an appearance in the first Epic Mickey, and again in this sequel, but it ended up being cut. However, this didn't stop the Queen of Hearts appearing on early versions of the front cover, despite never showing up in the game itself. 
She was later replaced with the Mad Hatter, who actually does feature in the game, though not as a villain. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're talking about Johnny from the classic SNES RPG, Chrono Trigger. Johnny is a cyborg from the future capable of transforming his body into a motorcycle. It's believed that he's based on the character of Danny Zuko, the leader of the gang T-Birds from the 1978 film Grease, played by John Travolta. Johnny's tire extensions also feature the brand name Bad Year, a parody of the real-life tire manufacturer Goodyear. Johnny actually goes on to make a reappearance in Chrono Cross, albeit in a small cameo form, demonstrating his untimely demise. Johnny's broken body can be seen along the roadside in the Dead Sea, near the Highwayman. Did you know? Splatoon was once going to be a Mario game, but Nintendo wanted a new franchise from Shigeru Miyamoto's junior team. The Splatoon team was formed from 10 developers of the core Animal Crossing team, and they were later joined by the director of Star Fox 64 3D. Many members of the team had worked together on various projects for the Wii U's launch, including the system's user interface and Nintendo Land. The central gameplay function of spraying ink to claim territory was chosen from a pool of over 70 ideas. When the game's core idea was first decided on, Nintendo was so far from creating characters and branding that the player was represented as a white or black box with a smaller box attached to it. The developers referred to these blocks as tofu with noses that shot ink. Part of the reason Nintendo chose this concept was because of a 4v4 prototype that was pitched with the game. In this prototype, the TV was used for a top-down map view, while the gamepad screen showed the actual character in 3D. Because of the way information was shown on the map, if the Tofu character overlapped matching ink, they'd be nearly invisible on the map screen. This eventually became the squid transformation mechanic. The bird's eye perspective of the map screen may have also contributed to why walls in the final game aren't worth points when covered in ink. Obviously, Tofu blocks couldn't be the final character designs for the game, so the team brainstormed different ideas. It was at this point that they considered using Mario, who would likely be accompanied by other Mushroom Kingdom characters. However, this was simply one potential choice out of several. It also had nothing to do with Super Mario Sunshine, where Mario cleans ink with a similar shooting mechanic. In fact, according to producer Hisashi Nogami, they had completely forgotten about Sunshine. We only remembered it later on, like, oh yeah, there was a water gun in Super Mario Sunshine. As Nintendo employees, that's pretty embarrassing. When discussing why the team eventually went with making a new IP versus using Mario, Shigeru Miyamoto said, When we talked about the possibility of it being Mario, of course we could think of the advantages. Anybody would be willing to touch it as soon as we announced that we had a new Mario game. But at the same time, we had some worries. If it were Mario, we wouldn't be able to create a new IP. Before they arrived at the Inkling design featured in the final game, a humanoid rabbit form was briefly considered. As rabbits are often variations of white, the ink would be easily visible, and their ears would move when viewed from the bird's eye view map which would help the player keep track of which direction their character is facing. When the design was pitched to the whole team and other Nintendo employees, people were confused as to why rabbits would be shooting ink, so they once again redesigned the characters. The last stop before their final design was an anthropomorphic squid creature that walked upright and presumably didn't change form. However, the team felt this iteration wouldn't come across as likable and eventually settled on using transforming inklings. One clever detail in the humanoid inklings design is that they retain their 10 squid appendages. They have two arms, two legs, two Two large tentacles which form their major hair features, and then four smaller tendrils above the back of their neck. A large part of the aesthetic choices behind Splatoon were inspired by youth culture, or more specifically, skateboarding culture. According to director Tsubasa Sakaguchi, the Inklings are approximately 14 years old and still like to be on skateboards. He also felt the entire concept of Turf Wars was cool and rebellious, like skateboarding. This idea inspired the rock-centric soundtrack for the multiplayer gameplay. Additionally, one of the levels is just flat out a skate park, and many of the other levels feature structures such as vert ramps and bowls. The urban environment featured in most of the levels is slightly inspired by the ink itself, which reminded the developers of graffiti, a theme realized in the Miiverse graffiti across the levels. This spun off into the fashion featured in the game, which was allegedly chosen because a staff member likes that kind of clothing. In an interview with Nintendo Life, Sakaguchi explained that the two dancing inklings, which sometimes show up in Inkopolis, are inspired by a piece of Japanese urban culture. In Japan, after closing hours, a lot of young people dance outside shopping malls. Four of our staff members actually took motion capture of us dancing, and some of these routines made it into the game. Sakaguchi's own dances were apparently not good enough to be in the game. 
The world of Splatoon has some self-referential secrets. The amiibo box found in Agopolis is actually a full render of the one in real life. However, the text on the box is replaced with Splatoon's inkling language. The team also had some fun hiding secrets in the game's promotional material. The music used in the game's trailer includes a number of mostly female Nintendo staff shouting Splatoon. To promote the game in the United States, Nintendo held the Splatoon Mess Fest at Santa Monica Pier in California. The fest hosted an obstacle course inspired by a level in the game and saw celebrities and fans getting inked. In Canada, Nintendo teamed up with Yogurty's Froyo to serve Squidsicle Sorbet and Inkberry Froyo in various locations. Meanwhile, in the UK, Nintendo partnered with Adrenaline Alley Skate Park. They covered the park with Splatoon-themed graffiti and props and installed Wii U demo stations for the public to play on. There are several regional differences between the European, American, and Japanese versions of Splatoon. The dialogue during the final boss fight is completely different between the European and American versions. In the American version, DJ Octavio makes constant puns, whereas he makes none in the European version. Between the Japanese and English versions of the game, many of the weapons are named something totally different. The ink brush in Japanese is simply called Pablo, named after the famous artist Pablo Picasso. The Aerospray MG, the splash o -matic, and the sploosh o -matic are the Pro Modeler MG, Sharp Marker, and Bold Marker in Japan. These changes are most likely references to model kit building, a hobby that is far more popular in Japan than it is in America. Lastly, the Octobrush is called Hakusai in Japan. This is a reference to the Edo period artist Katsushika Hakusai, painter of a piece called The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. The painting shows a woman in an explicitly sexual situation with a pair of octopuses. In today's episode, we'll be looking at a number of gaming-related lawsuits. Nintendo is a force to be reckoned with in the gaming industry. That doesn't make them untouchable or above the law. While a lawsuit against a company doesn't necessarily expose them for malicious intent, the reasons behind some charges can demonstrate a small lack of thought or care. When promoting their re-release of Donkey Kong Country Returns for 3DS, the company promoted the title at the Los Angeles Zoo. Their press release claimed that fans will get a chance to spend time with Donkey Kong and some of his friends from the Animal Kingdom. Throughout the day of the game's launch, May 24, 2013, actor Parker Mills was hired to wear a Donkey Kong outfit in the park. While this should have been a simple acting gig, Mills was denied the chance to take any breaks throughout the day, and wasn't given any of the required ice packs or even cold drinks to cool him down in the suit. This was particularly harsh, as he would be entertaining guests under the sweltering Southern Californian sun. Unsurprisingly, legal action was taken against Nintendo. The lawsuit alleged that the company's ambassador at the event, who escorted, oversaw, and instructed Mills for the day, failed to provide the proper care for their client. Mills's legal representatives say that, as a result, their client suffered from an aortic dissection, the tearing of aortic walls. This meant that the actor had to go through a surgery which implanted a permanent heart defibrillator. Strangely, this wouldn't be the last time Nintendo had a case against them relating to the negligent handling of an actor. In fact, it's not the last time that it would involve a Donkey Kong costume. In 2016, Nintendo hired Michael O'Connor-Trillo to suit up at a mall in Culver City, California. O'Connor-Trillo claims that, while the suit was poorly ventilated and unreasonably and dangerously hot, he was under strict orders not to remove the costume. Michael claims that by doing so, he has suffered mental and emotional distress, as well as permanent damage, though the lawsuit he filed doesn't mention any specific injuries. Nintendo has even had legal issues with Donkey Kong in his digital form in the past. Ikigami Shushinki, a Japanese manufacturing company who operated a video game division in the mid-80s, helped Nintendo create their arcade release of the original Donkey Kong. Ikigami Shushinki held a contract with Nintendo for the programming and manufacture of numerous arcade titles, including Donkey Kong, with Shigeru Miyamoto giving the company ideas and character designs to be put into the game. This contract meant that Itagami Sushinki would have the exclusive rights for producing the Donkey Kong arcade boards, a clause which Nintendo ignored, producing their own boards to keep up with the unexpected high demand for the game. Nintendo hired another company, Iwasaki Engineering, to reverse engineer the game to produce a sequel. This was because, as the game was originally produced by Ikigami, Nintendo didn't have a copy of the original source code for Donkey Kong in their possession. Ikigami Sushinki believed that Nintendo violated their contractual agreement over the game's ownership, claiming that Ikigami held ownership over the Donkey Kong code. In response, Nintendo filed an injunction against the company in 1983. In retaliation, Ikigami filed a law 
lawsuit against Nintendo regarding both Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr., a case which would go on until 1990, when a court decided that Nintendo did not own the original Donkey Kong arcade code. The two companies would go on to settle out of court, and despite the ruling, the arcade release of Donkey Kong would see two ports, one in Donkey Kong 64's Frantic Factory, and again as its own release on the Nintendo Switch under the Arcade Archives banner. Speaking of the Switch, the device itself is at the heart of its own lawsuit. In August 2017, GameVice, previously known as Wikipad Inc., claimed that Nintendo has infringed on their patent for their Joy-Con controllers. The patent, which was filed in 2012, relates to a pair of control modules which connect with a separate and distinct digital device. This patent was granted and served as the basis for their Wikipad, an Android tablet with its own detachable controllers which released in 2013 to mixed reviews. While looking to recoup damages from Nintendo, GameVice is also seeking out an injunction against the game's publisher, which will prevent Nintendo from continuing to sell the Switch itself. Their reasoning is that the sale of the Switch has caused and is continuing to cause damage and irreparable injury to GameVice. Most courts demonstrate a reluctance for injunctions against patent-related sales, meaning that such a move would be unlikely to play out, even if to prevent the sale of a product that directly competes with their own. While GameVice's Wikipad product is no longer manufactured and sold in stores, the company itself has since moved on to creating game controller peripherals for other mobile devices, such as phones and tablets, granting some gravity to their claims of damages from a competitor making use of their patent. Nintendo encountering legal battles with their peripherals is also nothing new. In 1991, Nintendo and Toys R Us faced a lawsuit looking for $10,000 in damages when Nicole Labruzzi received medical attention for carpal tunnel syndrome, a form of repetitive strain injury. Labruzzi would spend several hours a day for several weeks playing video games, in particular using the NES light gun controller to play Duck Hunt. While her issues lessened after she stopped playing the game, she would still feel numbness when trying to perform basic actions such as typing or carrying bags of shopping. Her legal team argued that the game should have been designed differently, or at least had a warning attached to the product which informed the customer of the potential for injury. This was one of the earliest cases of a claim against a company for strains relating to video games, coining the name Nintenditis. Did you know? Before Amiibo even existed, Nintendo had the chance to make a game using toys and RFID technology, the same tech found in Amiibo. Publisher Activision approached Nintendo about a partnership for a new RFID-based project which would include toys coming to life in a video game. Nintendo was initially interested in the offer, but ultimately turned it down. The venture was developed into the Skylanders series, which has gone on to gross over $3 billion. Skylanders developer Paul Ritchie told Polygon.com, They were just like, we have never seen anything like this before. I've always wondered about the full meaning of that comment. Clearly they have properties well suited to this world. Why it is they didn't rush in here will probably haunt them for the rest of their days. Though the Skylanders toy line had huge success, Nintendo's Amiibo currently has a greater market share than Activision's product. Amiibo were not Nintendo's first attempt at a Toys to Life video game. The downloadable title Pokemon Rumble U was their flagship attempt at using the Wii U's near-field communication RFID technology. The game did relatively well, debuting at the number one slot on the Wii U eShop, though it was considered a critical failure. Roughly a year after the release of Pokemon Rumble U, Nintendo showcased a prototype Mario figurine at an investors meeting. The platform was codenamed NFP for both NFC Featured Platform and Nintendo Figurine Platform. The toys were said to work across multiple games, and gamers were told they'd be given more details about the project during E3 2014. At their E3 event, Nintendo officially unveiled Amiibo to the public, along with Amiibo functionality in Super Smash Bros. for Wii U. Currently, around 15 million Amiibo have been sold, with the Super Smash Bros. Link figurines selling the most units. Nintendo did not expect Amiibo to sell anywhere near as well as they have been. Nintendo UK's James Honeywell told MVC, Right from the outset, we hoped Amiibo would be strong, but even our expectations have been smashed. Amiibo supply has never been on par with demand, as seen with the Gold Mario figurine. Target's stock of that Amiibo sold out in just 15 minutes. Nintendo's low-balled expectations might also explain why Amiibo stock has been so scarce. That said, some outlying factors have made the situation worse. One strange example is that a truck carrying Splatoon Amiibo was stolen in the UK. 
Retailer Games said that due to the robbery, it wouldn't be able to supply the special edition version of the game. The special edition came with the Squid Amiibo, and buying this version was the only way to get the Squid figurine in Europe. Nintendo sent out extra stock to make sure consumers could find a copy of the actual game, and Game offered a £10 discount, equal to $15 US dollars, to affected customers. It's not currently known if the truck was a random case of theft, or if the robbers targeted the vehicle because of its rare Amiibo cargo. Fans have been notably upset about persistent Amiibo shortages, but they aren't the only ones criticizing Nintendo. Executive producer of Disney Infinity, John Vignaki, criticized Nintendo over Amiibo stock shortages, saying it is irresponsible and rude to your hardcore fans. Nintendo has apologized for the shortages and promised that more Amiibo will be manufactured to meet the demand in the future. The soon-to-be-released Amiibo cards are also intended to address the figurine shortages, as the cards are easier to produce. One lesser known detail about Amiibo is that the font used in the brand's logo is Bohost 93. This is the same font used in the title screens for Super Mario Bros., Super Mario Bros. 2, and the new Super Mario Bros. series. It's not known if this is a reference to Mario, or if Nintendo just likes the Bohost typeface. Several logo designs were developed before Nintendo decided on a final Amiibo logo. In the 2015 Nintendo Company Guide, variations of the Amiibo logo and some completely different packaging were shown off. These images also showcase a different design for both the Bowser and Mario figures. Early models from Nintendo's E3 digital event appeared to be much more detailed than the publicly available toys, leading many fans to be disappointed with the quality of the figurines. That said, it's apparently a common occurrence in the toy market for high-quality samples to be revealed, followed by less detailed mass-produced figures hitting store shelves. Speaking of toy production, prototype amiibo have been smuggled out of Chinese production lines and put up for sale on Chinese and American auction sites. These amiibo are generally molds that lack paint and in several cases were unfinished prototypes. One model was a Mi Sword Fighter amiibo, which at the time had not even been announced yet. And that's not the only amiibo leak that's taken place. In February of 2015, Nintendo of America accidentally leaked safety documents showcasing gold and silver Mario amiibos months before their official reveals. Nintendo have also experimented with the idea of making Amiibo focused on objects rather than characters. During an interview at E3 2015, Shigeru Miyamoto told IGN that he wants an R-Wing Amiibo. Earlier, we talked about how the 3D model of the R-Wing will actually transform into a two-legged walker in the game. We have an actual model, and we're thinking how much it would actually cost to make when it's transformable. Can we actually do that? Whether or not this transforming amiibo will make it to stores is yet to be seen, but it wouldn't be the first conceptual amiibo Nintendo abandoned. While making Majora's Mask 3D, Nintendo wanted to make a Skull Kid amiibo. Zelda developer Eiji Awanuma told GameSpot, one of the things that was really difficult was, because this was a remake of the game, we didn't have the opportunity to build the kind of gameplay that would connect to using an amiibo in this way. Ultimately, and unfortunately, we had to back off of that idea. This might be why Nintendo released a collectible Skull Kid figurine along with the game. There's also been some fairly interesting results from using amiibo in games. A Fox amiibo took third place in a Super Smash Bros. Wii U tournament against real humans in Richmond, British Columbia. The amiibo was named Wave Shine, and it made it all the way to to the loser's finals, but was ultimately knocked out of the contest by one of the best Smash players in the region, Firefly. Did you also know that the Pokemon Lugia was created after a binge of drugs and alcohol? Or that there's a lost Pokemon movie about a literal dinosaur? For a whole hour of Pokemon facts, check out the video on screen. The gaming market's transition into 3D was not an immediate steady success. There were rough patches along the way, in part due to a lack of defined industry standards for 3D game design. But these lack of standards also birthed a huge wave of fresh and creative games that defined the second half of the 90s gaming space. The N64 was Nintendo's big push into this space, and although it hugely underperformed compared to Sony's PlayStation, it was by no means a complete failure. This console, with its odd-looking controller and minimal third-party support, managed to squeeze out some defining classics and hidden gems. And after all, it's the games that make a system good or not. Games like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, spin-offs like Pokemon Snap, and even third-party titles like DMA Design's Body Harvest are all remembered fondly. And we'll be talking about these games and a few more in this episode, but let's kick off with Diddy Kong Racing. For a spin-off game in the Donkey Kong series, Diddy Kong Racing was a surprisingly well-made competitive racer. But in retrospect, one element of the game seems a bit odd. What makes the game seem somewhat unusual is its roster of characters. 
Diddy, Banjo, Conker, and even Crunch was a nod to the Donkey Kong Country titles. But the rest of the characters that fleshed out the roster were, uh, well, yeah. One of these characters is the fairly forgettable Bumper the Badger. My name's Bumper! Not much information surrounds Bumper in the game itself, with his character bio being fairly sparse. Reading, Unlike most of his kind, Bumper the Badger prefers speed and thrills to a quiet nocturnal lifestyle. He gets even more worked up than his friends when he realizes how much racing and excitement will be involved in the crusade to get rid of Whizpig. A 2004 public address by Rare was written in character from Conker to promote the release of Conker Live and Reloaded. In this address, Conker makes mention of where characters wound up after the events of Diddy Kong Racing, stating, It goes without saying that you wouldn't catch me hanging out with any of those freaks these days. Last I heard, at least one of them was in jail anyway. While Conker never mentioned who this character might be, in response to a fan letter in 2012, Rare revealed some more information about what happened to Bumper, and it seems Bumper's thrill-seeking attitude may have been seduced by the cheap thrills of crime. Rare responded to a question from Aaron Pinky H, who asked, Where do your beloved characters like Cameo and Banjo go when not used in any games for the next decade? Is there some kind of nightclub, or perhaps a prison cell, or are they… dead? Their response was that all these characters are having adventures far too expensive to adapt into games, with the exception of Bumper the Badger, who is in jail. With that said, Rare did send out a tweet in 2021 stating that Bumper has actually been free for a while now, or at least on parole, and that he is superficially sorry for all the bad things he did. What Bumper did to find himself behind bars remains a mystery, but based on those cold dead eyes, we can only assume the worst. Speaking of causing mischief, Mischief Makers was a much-beloved title on the Nintendo 64. While there's a number of games which are known to let players input their age, such as with Dead or Alive most famously, where doing so will adjust the game's jiggle physics, Mischief Makers actually had the option, but having it serve an entirely different purpose. When first starting up the game, it will ask the player for an age between 0 and 99. Most might assume that this age choice is simply referring to the player's age, but it actually uses this input to select the age of the main protagonist, Marina Lightyears. The purpose of this choice isn't very clear during the bulk of the game, but it does have a single effect on one frame of the game's true ending. If the player sets Marina's age to 15 years or younger, her true human form will be physically closer to that of a child, while if her age is set to 16 years or older, her true human form will be closer to that of an adult. It's unclear why the developers would put effort into a feature that only affects a single frame of the game, but there you go. Another cult title was Body Harvest, which came from the team at Rockstar before the team at Rockstar would become known as the team at Rockstar. Everyone over at the then-named DMA Design were super enthusiastic about the N64, and most of all, working with Nintendo. The studio's previous publisher, Psygnosis, didn't show much interest in DMA's games, but Nintendo frequently directed them to make major changes to Body Harvest's gameplay and visual style in order to improve its chances on the market. While everyone had a huge amount of respect for each other and wanted an open conversation about how to improve the game, the language barrier between the Japanese publisher and British developer made implementing these changes difficult, as the devs sometimes struggled to understand what Nintendo wanted from them. One developer cited an example where Nintendo told DMA to make the game's graphics more materialistic. DMA's head, David Jones, described their relationship with Nintendo, saying, it's a very hard relationship because their quality is so high that it's so hard to match the quality of the products they do, and they really want you to focus on making Nintendo products. It's very hard to write games that you're not writing for yourself, which is traditionally what I've done. And basically, we just have to listen to them because we're not as good as they are. Nobody in the world is as good as they are, so we'd be daft to try and say, we think you're wrong. So we just have to work with them, and we implement everything that they ask for. The two companies would ultimately drift apart, and DMA became Rockstar North, part of the Rockstar Games label. One more highly respected N64 title not made by Nintendo themselves came from Rare, Blast Core. 
It wasn't just things like camera controls that became an issue with the budding 3D developers when producing games for this new console. When developing Blast Core, the team worked hard to make sure the game didn't face any performance issues as a result of topping out the Nintendo 64's graphical capabilities. So they chose to set a polygon limit for character models in the game. This limit helped to ensure that gameplay remained smooth. However, while creating the Thunder Fist robot's model, Rare managed to accidentally go over their self-imposed limit. As a means of trying to reduce the amount of polygons the robot would use, the dev simply removed one of the robot's arms, resulting in the character's design changing into something a bit more unique. Few other devs have realized that an easy way to reduce the polygon count is simply by maiming their characters. Pokemon Snap is arguably one of the franchise's most popular spin-off titles, taking away the typical enslavement and battle mechanics of Pokemon, and instead putting the player behind a lens. While the player might not take on an active role of pummeling Pokemon, or rather commanding other Pokemon to do so, they're given a variety of tools which can either elevate the creature's mood, or frankly, piss them off. It's your mission to take great photos, but in doing so, Nintendo gave the player an option of throwing a pester ball at Pokemon to spur on some more irritated expressions or behaviors. While this is of course a work of fiction, the idea of hurling noxious purple gas with the sole intent of pestering the creatures whilst they enjoy their natural habitat does seem a little unusual for the Pokemon series. As a result, when it came time for the game's sequel, these balls were removed, as well as the apple, which was replaced with a fluff root. New Pokemon Snap's director, Haruki Suzaki, stated, The pester ball was an important element to bring out Pokemon's reaction in the Nintendo 64 Pokemon Snap, so we decided to add the role of the pester ball to the fluff root in new Pokemon Snap. Even though Fluffroot doesn't hurt when it hits a Pokemon, it makes sense that some Pokemon don't like being hit by Fluffroot. So we designed the item to leave it up to players whether they place it near a Pokemon or throw it at a Pokemon. So it seems developers were still all for pissing Pokemon off a bit, but they prefer being a bit more tactful about it. As we mentioned at the start of this video, the N64 was a new adventure for Nintendo, and having to start developing games in 3D was no small task. Plenty of new complications come along with the addition of a third dimension, and so it was important during development to have a greater understanding of what mistakes had been made. What's interesting, however, is that a debugging tool, which shows more information on why a game has crashed or encountered an error, is actually still present in the final retail copy of Zelda. After the game crashes for whatever reason, inputting a series of button combinations will result in information being thrown up on screen about the game and the environment that was present at the time of crashing. An odd curiosity can be seen from Ocarina's debug menu, however, where the game's version information doesn't simply contain the version information, but also an additional message of seemingly no purpose. I love you. I mean, we aren't complaining about being told that at least something in the world loves us, but we didn't exactly think it would be a copy of Ocarina of Time that would show us more love than our parents did. Today we're taking a look at some trivia for several Nintendo 64 games, and what better way to kick off the video than with some secrets from a few of the N64's most beloved titles, the original Mario Party trilogy. All three titles have one peculiar unused scenario that can still be found in their data, and even put back into the game using GameShark codes. The scenario in question is an unused instance of there being no minigame to play. If there isn't a minigame to play when a character's turn ends, the panel behind their icon and stats will turn yellow, and a large no-game graphic will pop up on screen. The game will continue to the next round, completely skipping the minigame segment. However, if it's the last round of the game, a large Game Over graphic will pop up on screen instead, and the game will end as it normally would. This data is still within Mario Party 2 and 3, and can also be triggered with GameShark codes, but it acts a little differently. The scenario plays out the same way, but the graphic for No Game doesn't appear. If it's the last turn of the game, not only will no Game Over graphic appear, but the game actually continues onto a new round that shouldn't exist. For example, turn 20 of a 20 turn game will become turn 21. Mario Party 3 also has another interesting secret. 
Under normal conditions, when starting the game for the first time, all characters are unlocked from the offset. This is despite the fact that the back of Mario Party 3's game box alludes to how players can even unlock new characters in the one-player challenge, something which is just entirely not true. What's interesting is that, should the game be forced into the main menu with an unutilized save, which means the player has managed to bypass the game's attempt to load any sort of save file data, both Waluigi and Daisy will be unselectable during a match setup. Not only this, but they'll appear as otherwise unused question mark icons. Furthermore, from within the game's debug settings menu, it's possible to enable the characters, making it clear that the intention was for both of these characters to initially be unlockable, rather than playable from the offset. It's likely that this idea was dropped fairly late during development, as it was used as an advertisable feature on the game's box. One of the big reasons that the N64 is so fondly remembered today is because of Rare and the games they created. We all know that Rare made great N64 titles like Conker's Bad Fur Day, Perfect Dark, and Banjo-Kazooie, and that Rare owned the rights to all of these franchises. But this wasn't always the case. Unlike Conker and Perfect Dark, 